everybody. Welcome to the lecture for chapter four. Um, chapters four and five and to six are really going to be focusing on agriculture as one of the key understandings of how we utilize fire and how this factor changes how we engage in agriculture as well as how it changes society. So let's get into all right, let's talk a bit about agriculture, um, particularly fire with agriculture. And in order to understand fire with agriculture, we have to go over some key ideas around agriculture. So when we think through terms around agriculture, we usually define a vague point in time between hunter-gatherers and agrarian societies. Um, Th that point is a big gray point. There are actually still hunter-gatherers out in society today. Um, but we, we generally talk about 10,000 years ago being kind of the point at which this concept of agriculture starts to arise. And with it comes a different type of society, a much more, um, a, a non-transient society. So and how we engage with that type of agriculture really kind of depends upon what we're doing. So for the vast majority of agriculture, well, we should first define what agriculture is. So agriculture is a science, it's an art, and it's a business. And it's all of those things simultaneously. So when we talk about agriculture as a science, we, you're at Cal Poly, we're, we're a big ag school we study different ways that we can engage in agriculture to create best practices, to figure out how we can work best with the soil, work with the plants, what do we need to change? What do we keep the same? How do we adjust to where we're at? So there's a lot of science to this, but there's also an art to agriculture because M mother nature does not always wanna co cooperate. You have to learn to understand what the ecosystem and plants are trying to tell you. And while some of that is science, a lot of that is is kind of art. Um, also, there's a real beauty in growing things and raising things and seeing that life start and produce and end and really understanding the cycles of life the cycles of the year and the place that you're at. Um, so there's a lot of art to it. It's also a business. Um, and once we start to figure out how not to just engage in subsistence agriculture, but we're, we're able to start to grow more food than we need, we also start to see the development of trade. And then we see the development of money and of more complex societies. We also see the freeing up of people to do other things. So, so this idea of surplus as opposed to just enough to make it by really shifts how society works as well. So an agrar agrarian is a way of life and agricultural is the way of life in an agriculturally based society. Um, so when we talk about hunter gatherers, I'm gonna talk a lot more about them on the next slide. So I'm just going to give you a uh, quick overview. So rather than intentionally growing, oftentimes monocultures, um, that's single crops, um, you are able to gather what you need from the environment. Now, I want to emphasize that hunter-gatherers aren't just hoping things are going to grow they're very intentional about how they engage with the environment, but we'll get more into that in the next slide. So then we have subsistence agriculture and subsistence agriculture is where you eat most of what you produce. Um, and oftentimes this, the way that we clear the ground is through slash and burn and subsistence agriculture can be juxtaposed with commercial agricultures where farmers are selling most of their crops. Um, and so if you're selling most of your crop as opposed to consuming most of your crop, then you are engaging in commercial agriculture. And then we have pastoralism. Um, this is animal husbandry. So this involves the breeding and herding of animals for human needs. 
Um, so that's both food, shelter, and clothing, all of which can come from animals. Um, so most pastoralists are practicing transhumanists, which is the movement of herds according to the seasonal rhythms. So you'd be in warmer lowlands in the winter, cooler highlands in the summer. So you'd be moving your cattle around or your, well, your cattle, goat, sheep, whatever it is that you're growing um, in pastoralism. You're moving your herd around based on seasonal trends in the place that you're at. Um, so those are some basic definitions. Now we can talk, we, we need to talk a little bit about hunter-gatherers because especially in Western culture, we have this idea of the noble hunter-gatherers passively living off what the land can give them and you know, embracing mother nature's ways and things like that. And, and while it's true that hunter-gatherers absolutely are living off the land, the, it's not passive. They are actively engaging in manipulating their ecosystems in order to ensure they have the plants and animals and fungi and nuts and fruits that they need. So it's it's not some passive practice. Um, it also involves a lot of knowledge about what you can and cannot eat, how to prepare those things to make them safe. Um, a good example is acorns. You, you, just, you just can't go to an oak tree and grab a bunch of acorns and start eating them. You're gonna get sick. There's a whole process by which you leach out the tannins and you boil them down and you grind them and you create meal out of them and then you cook that. So there's a whole process you have to know. Um, you know, hunter-gatherers also were the ones that figured out what we could and could not eat. Um, I often see a meme in some of my agricultural websites that talk about all food is edible at least once, right? So you can eat the food. That doesn't mean that food was good for you. And that doesn't mean that you're making it through the day having eaten that food. Um, so it's, we also need to give a shout out to our ancestors who looked at different plants and fungi and things and went, hmm, should I eat this? Should I try this? And uh, what does this do for me, right? Um, and and if something didn't work, they needed to communicate that before they died. I'm thinking in terms, particularly of mushrooms. Um, I, I follow a number of mycelium groups and um, you know, all mushrooms are edible once. Um, so just imagine you're you're looking at this whole bevy of different types of mushrooms and you have to figure out what is tasty for dinner? What might make me like hallucinate? And what might kill me? A and differentiate. Somebody had to try these all at least once. Um, now we've been doing this for at least a few million years. Um, so hunter hunting and gathering is very different than scavenging. Um, scavenging is, is kind of hoping and finding what, what you get. Whereas um, hunter-gatherers are very purposeful, they understand the what is available in different seasons, um, how weather patterns and climate patterns can impact what is available to them, where they need to move to in order to get the right foods at the right time, um, and what practices they can use on the ecosystem to encourage certain types of plants and animals and things to grow when they want. Um, we've primarily been hunter-gatherers for about 90% of human history. And of course, you have to be mobile and understand the natural cycles. Um, and one of the exceptions, by the way, to a lot of that mobility is if you're in a particularly bountiful place where you can be there all year. Um, the coast of California is a great example because we have very bountiful oceans. And so uh, the Chumash and the Miwok and... Some other tribes were able to actually just stay where they were because they had the bounty they needed right where they're at. Um, most of the time, hunter-gatherer groups are familial-based. Um, they are not overly large. They do move around with other tribes and, and come together and things like that. Um, and so it's important for us to kind of think through this. They used a lot of fire 
as a purposeful way to manipulate the ecosystem, which is something we'll talk about in a few slides. So to give you a feel of what hunting and gathering looks like, um, particularly in our ancestors, this is before we see agriculture. So this is around 15,000 years ago. Um, this is when we had last glacial maximum vegetation. So the glaciers are going down pretty far. Um, but you can see that a lot of places are tropical grasslands, which means they look very different than they do today. Um, we also, so all of these areas here in kind of this blue spotty area are tropical grasslands. Um, and you'll know that this is, notice that this is tropical desert. Um, that has to do with the vegetation there. Um, we have a lot fewer savannas. The savannas are much bigger than they used to be. Over here in the US, we have um, more of this temperate steep and grasslands and things like that. Um, you can see up here, we have more polar alpine. This again is very cold. We don't have a lot of humans living up here. Um, but this gives you a feel of what things are looking like. And remember, all of this is all glacier and all very cold. Um, and so you, you don't have a lot of vegetation options because it's actually under ice. Um, it's important for us to kind of know about this because when we start to see glacial recession, that's where we really start to see a shift in how the development of um, agriculture. And that has to do a lot with shifting um, rainfall patterns and the availability of fresh water in different ways. Um, the shift in um, sea level rise, we know that there was a number of abrupt in geologic times, sea level rise events. Um, Australia used to be very well connected to this whole mass and now of course it's not. Um, and that's kind of reflected here. The, this right now is Southeast Asia and it's mostly islands. Australia is really kind of this bit now. So you can see that there's a lot more connectivity. Um, you can also see that um, Central America looks very different as well. So we have, when we see this um, deglaciation, we see a, a massive shift in temperature. We see a warming of the world. Um, we see a lot more access to land areas. And we see a shift in coastal plains and the availability, the ability of places like what becomes the Fertile Crescent up in here to actually support agriculture after about 5,000 years after glacial maximum. So let's talk about hunter-gatherers and migration. Just like we talked about in chapter two, um, we learn to bring fire with us and uh, we start to migrate. We start to leave where we originated in, in Africa in a series of waves. We learn to bring fire with us. As we see this warming and the shift, we bring fire to different places. We start to use fire to clear the land. Um, and of course, we also start to have an impact on the ecosystems we start to go to. Um, there is a pop, there is a argument to be made that um, Homo sapien migration had an impact on extinctions. Um, we know that there is a correlation. Correlation is not causation, but we happen to see major extinction events occur around the time humans start to show up. Now, this could also be reflecting some shifts in the climates in those areas, changes in food regimen, um, but uh, let's face it, woolly mammoths, probably pretty tasty just like you saw in Ice Age in your childhood, where Manny was talking about how his wife was trapped and killed by those humans. And uh, we have our favorite little proto squirrel with his acorn, which kind of causes all kinds of mayhem as we start to see deglaciation. Um, we also, because of abrupt sea level rise, start to see a lot of places 
become islands and disconnected from what what their connection to the mainland, which causes a lot more isolated populations. Um, and that isolated population also impacts their ability to access things that they had in their past. We also start to see some specialization occur among Homo sapiens, especially during the middle and upper Paleolithic period, which is 50 to 70,000 years ago. Um, we see hunter-gatherer bands as they're migrating out of that central rift valley. Um, and it's not just Homo sapiens. We also see this with Neanderthals and the Florentine population. And there's one other population whose name begins with a D that I'm totally forgetting about. They also do some specialization. So we we are not alone. There are other um, homo, homo species out there that we're existing with. Um, but And we start to see specialization with them as well. Um, we start to see hunter-gatherers concentrating especially on either large game hunting or we start to see fishing. Um, some of the specialization work involved creating specialized tools. Somebody had to figure out that if I use the right sort of bone harpoon, I can get fish. If I weave these different types of plant fibers together, I can make rope. And from that, I can make nets. Oh, I can use this hook to, and some of that really thin rope to cast out fishing line. All of these are specialized technologies that have to be invented at some point in time um, for humans to be able to use. Now, we might be looking at other animals that have evolved these sorts of specializations and we're trying to mimic them, but somebody had to create these specializations. Um, and of course, as one moves away from the equator, access to plants change significantly. And so you're going to need to start to have some specialization. So how and what human hunter gather, what humans hunt and, and gather depended on the ecosystem. Um, if you had a much higher meat diet, like we see as you move towards the North Pole, um, then how your body is utilizing meat is going to be different. Matter of fact, there are some populations that live up in the Arctic Circle where meat is actually the vast, is like 80, 80 to 90% of their diet because they don't have plants to grow the rest of the time. Um, but you need to be able to gather and create specialized technologies, especially for those bigger animals. Um, walrus, not small. Um, horses, elk, moose, bear, th those are not small animals and you, you can't just like sneak up on them. So you have to start creating technologies in order to be able to hunt these animals. Um, and the importance of plant food decreases as you have access to greater protein sources, both aquatic and land. Um, and a reduction in plants, the gathering side, and an increased dependence on hunting um, you also have to be much more aware of animal behavior, animal husbandry, and how you're going to be able to hunt those animals. All right, so let's talk about some hunter-gatherers and fire. Remember, we're the fire species. Us and fire co-evolve and co-colonize our new ecosystems. Because we can bring fire with us, um, we are now able to take fire into places fire has not been in the past. And we're able to use fire uh, as a tool in a bunch of different types of situations. Um, first of all, we can use fire to create some fire breaks, right? Fighting fire with fire. We can clear out encampments, clear out spaces where we might build our villages, um, and use really low level fire for that. Um, we can also use fire to clear corridors or pathways we might need to follow in order to more easily get to the places we're going. Um, you do not have to fight the forest when you can just burn it down. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. Um, and those species end up evolving fire resilience, especially if they're having fire put on them every year or every couple of years. Um, Fire is also something we use for pest reduction. Um, 
We use it a bit in the camps, encampments, as well as to prevent food infestation. Um, one of the big issues we hear we have here on the Central Coast is acorn weevils. Um, and historically, when the acorns are starting to develop, we would the people living in these types of ecosystems would light low-level fires every year. And that smoke and the heat would prevent the weevils from getting into the acorns. And when you have that going on every year, it really limits the population. Um, th this, by the way, is what an acorn weevil looks like. See, its head looks kind of like an acorn, but also it lives in the acorns. So if your acorns have acorn weevils, you can't eat them. And acorn, for places that have acorns, is a very important source of food. Um, we can also clear line of sight. This can help with hunting. Um, it also helps to make it easier to find your way places. Um, hunter gatherers absolutely used fire as to a way to promote certain species over others. Remember I said hunter gatherers are not just these passive people, but they're really engaging with their ecosystems. So we know that um, in basket weaving societies, fresh shoots, particularly the, the first year after a fire, are absolutely the best shoots to be using in bas basket weaving, um, particularly if you're making like a baby board or something like that. And so that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and of course, it helps us hunt both small and large areas. Burning riparian areas will attract grazers to all the new grasses, and that makes it easier to hunt. Um, we can also use fire as a means to drive herds off cliffs, and that makes them easier to hunt. I have posted a link to the Tending the Wilds fire video. Um, it's about a 20 minute video that you need to watch. Um, I do ask questions from this video on the quiz, so please make sure you don't skip over it, but I'm not gonna include it in this lecture. So the, the link is on the website for week three. All right, so just to give you a feel of the types of hunter-gatherers in 2000 BC, so this is about 4,000 years ago, um, you can see that most of the world is hunter-gatherers, although we do start to see nomadic pastoralists in this purple area. We start to see um, the development of more complex societies through agriculture, and then state societies emerging about 4,000 years ago as we start to switch from hunter-gatherers into um, what we'll call agrarian societies. All right, so around 9,000 years ago, that's 6,000 BCE, if you will, um, we are well into the Hamlicene. Um, and this is the start of the domestication of plant animals. It arises in those key areas that I just showed you, right? So we're, we're seeing it arise here in South America. We're seeing it arise in the Middle East. We're seeing it arise in China and the Indus, in the Indus Valley um, in what is now Pakistan. Um, so there's a couple things that are going on around 9,000 years ago. First of all, we have glacial recession. So the planet's getting a wee bit warmer. Um, and this means that we have shifts in our climates. Again, this is a slow change over time. This is not within a hundred year period, we've warmed up the planet 1.5 degrees Celsius. This takes a couple thousand years for this to happen. Um, so we start to see the development and domestication of plants and animals. This happens around the same time in multiple places. And um, this has a lot to do with shifts in both wet dry cycles as well as um, warmer climates around the equator. Matter of fact, we have really been in kind of this unique sweet spot for the last 10,000 years in terms of climate um, and where we can grow things, climate, climate cycles. Um, we, we tend to be kind of in that sweet spot. And because we start to see this warming trend, we also see new plants 
start growing in places they hadn't grown before because that land is now available. Um, and it's also warm enough to support growth cycles. And of course, as we see this, we see the expansion of humankind and migration, um, and we're taking fire with us, um, we start to see that in some places, we are able to grow, or we start to be able to gather enough food where we don't need to leave for the next cycle. We're able to stay where we are. Uh, and then we're, remember, we were already intentionally engaging with the ecosystem. So now we're continuing that engagement with the ecosystem. And we start to see the development of things like saws, drills, hand plowing. Um, so this allows for us to put into the ground in a little bit more of an intentional way, the plants we want to grow. Um, and the agricultural revolution, this is the first agricultural revolution, by the way, there are three, um, really also starts to engage with fire because fire becomes an important way to clear new land. And our ability to grow enough food to feed ourselves on a regular basis and starting to feed other people on a regular basis um, also is coincided with a lot of the reduction in the supply of game and wild food plants because they're able to spread out more. Um, this agricultural revolution also increases the population from about 10 million humans in 5000 BCE to between 50 and 100 million humans in 1000 BCE. So we grow our population between um, five and 10 times. Um, and this is all happening in these key fire prone areas. So that's the other thing. These are the key fire prone areas. So these are much more likely to be grasslands. Cereal crops tend to be the ones that we plant first, like your wheats, your barleys, your grains. Um, and those are all coming from grasses and lagoons. Um, so they already exist in these spaces. We're able to be much more intentional about planting them. And this, of course, is what the agri first agricultural revolution is. All right. So controlling the fuel, the key to agriculture, is not just that we're controlling the flame, we're controlling the fuels on the landscape as well. Because we're no longer nomadic, we actually need fire more than ever. Um, fire allows us to help select what species we want, and then it allows us to change the landscapes. Um, and because we're not moving from place to place to place, we are waiting in a single place for our crops to mature. Um, we also have to figure out how to keep warm, how to find all the other foods. We have to start to learn food storage. Um, and of course, we start to have to figure out how to build long lasting shelters that aren't going to burn down. So now we have building technologies coming into place as well. And of course, the hearth, which is where we keep the fire inside our homes, leads to a whole different way of thinking about that built space. The shift in for, to agriculture also allows us to change our social systems. Our, our whole way, whole society starts to really, really change. First of all, we're having larger and larger groups of people. Um, and of course we need larger groups of people because we need their labor. Um, early farmers are expending a lot more energy to grow food than we do today. Um, we also need more land, so we start to use fire technologies as a way to clear more land so we can grow more food, um, especially since we're concentrating on pretty high carbohydrate crops like cereals, cereals rice, potatoes. Um, we're also starting to learn about how we can engage in some selective crop growing. Um, and we're also learning about soils, soil nutrients, soil runoff, water cycles, water capture. All of these things are things that we start to learn. Remember I said agriculture is a, as much of a science as an art. This is where that science, science art introduction comes to each other. So in terms of agriculture, there are three agricultural revolutions. The first is the agricultural revolution I just talked about. Um, the creation of farming. 
Um, the second agricultural revolution has a lot to do with improvements in how we're engaging in farming, particularly yoke for oxen, replacing oxes with horses, increasing and rethinking how we're using plows. Um, we're really starting to think about inputs into agricultural production, such as fertilizers, drainage fields. I mean, if you look at agriculture in Egypt, in Babylon, you can see this sort of technologies come into play. And then of course, this is our third agricultural revolution, um, which is really, ha which really happened in, starting in the 1700s, definitely in the 1800s with mechanization, chemical farming and fertilizers, um, herbicide applications, fungicides, pesticides, and of course, now we're able to grow a great deal of food with very few people. So the first two phases really involve inputs. The third involves the creating farms to be more like manufacturing. So this map here shows where we start to see farming come from. Um, the primary seed hearths are these green dots can see them in the Middle East, here in parts of Africa, here you can see at the Indus Valley, and then secondary seed areas, you can see them expand out. Um, and then of course you have your animal centers and you can see how these technologies disperse themselves. Um, and please note that we do have a land bridge happening over here and people are going back and forth from Asia into North America. We have a growing amount of archeological evidence that shows that this was happening maybe 30, 35,000 years ago. So we're bringing these foodways with us and then adapting them to where we're at. Um, okay, we are gonna watch a quick video on the um, human population through time. Um, I am not going to play the music because the music is lame. Um, I really want you to just focus on what this is looking like. So we're gonna start off very early on and you're gonna get to see some of the key moments of human evolution. So here we are um, 200,000 years ago, we are in Africa. Um, and about 100,000 years ago, we start migrating. We're going out this way. Um, population still very, 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 very small. Um, even though we're spreading out, we're about 50,000 years ago. Definitely lower than a million. Lower than a million people for a very long period of time. Because hunting and gathering doesn't support very large populations. And now we've got farming. Uh, and of course, we start to see the population really pick up. You can see this going whoop, going up. Um, and these are our population centers, right? So we are in the year one, 1 AD. There's about 170 million people. One dot is every is a million people, just so you know. So it gives you a feel of where people are. I'm going to pause this because I want you to notice. We have populations here in North America. But we have much more dense populations here around the Mediterranean, here in China, and here in India. So this is the time of the Roman Empire and the Han Dynasty. Um, and this is about 800 years ago. So you can see their spread. You can see the populations growing a little bit at a time. We don't see massive population booms. And now we're seeing the Silk Road. This is about the year 200. Now we're seeing the additional spread of technologies and knowledge. We still have the Roman Empire and the Silk Road. Um, and now we're hitting the golden age of India, which most people don't end up hearing about. But India has this amazing period from about 300 to 700 years where it's just doing amazing things. We still have the, the, the dynasties going on in China. You see Japan. Um, 
You see the peak of the Mayan civilization, civilization coming in over in uh, Central America. We're in the 600s, up oh, Mayans, oh, the birth of Islam. Now we start to see populations growing up in Africa. We're seeing much more grow up in India. Um, and you can start to see some in Europe. Oh, smallpox takes out a bunch of Japan. Yep, disease is as important in the story of humans as uh, innovations are. Gunpowder just got invented in China, and then it's going to spread as quickly as Westerners can get it out to Western Europe. Now we're at about a thousand years ago. We're at about 250 million people. And, and now you're going to start to see some significant booms because we're changing in our technologies. Now we've got the navigation, we've got the compass for navigating. So now we're able to go places more efficiently. Human population is about up to 400 million. Black Death is going to, oh, the Mongol Empire. You're going to see China start to collapse. Yep, there goes, there goes China. Look at, the Mongols are doing a thing over here. India is hoping the Himalayas are keeping the Mongols out. They do. It works. Woo! Up, oh, bubonic plague. Oh no, the world population is in decline. The plague takes out um, quite a few people. There are other, this is the Black Death, but there are other plagues that do wipe out civilizations. Now we've got Europeans starting to show up in America, and now we've got the transatlantic slave trade. This again starts to really shift the population in the Americas. We have also seen a decline in the Americas because Europeans brought over a whole bunch of diseases that North and South American populations didn't have immunities to. And look at Europe is exploding with people. And part of the reason why they need to have all of these colonies is because they need somewhere to put all these people and feed them. Now we have the Industrial Revolution. It looks like the world is exploding because it is. Now we've got modern medicine. We've got world wars. Even with the world wars, we're still not losing population. And, and suddenly in the 1950s, it goes crazy. And this is right now. We just hit 8 billion people. We think we might end up with peak human at around 9.5 billion um, in about 50 years. So our doubling of our population um, is happening pretty quick. We'll have to see how climate change impacts all of that. All right. And a lot of this explosion has to do with the uh, change from hunting and fishing. I mean, hunting and gathering into farming. So how does farming change society? Um, one, it makes more people survive. So if you have more people surviving, you need more food. And because you need more food, you have more people focusing on activities like finding food and growing food um, and growing more high calorie food. But we also see some negative things start to happen. For the first time in human history, we start to have a number of really serious issues like arthritis that we just don't see as much in the historical record. We also see people live longer, um, those permanent settlements and excess food mean that more and more people don't have to farm, which allows us to create hierarchies in society where some people are farming and some people are doing other things. This includes administrative work, leadership, the creation of more complex religious systems, um, we, we start to see a, an entire priest class of people as opposed to one or two individuals that still have to do hunting and gathering. So we start to see, we also start to see the development of more complex physical spaces too. So we see the development of towns and cities. With this population explosion, we also start to see impacts on ecosystems. Because when you have more people, you need more food. And to grow more food, you need more land. And this starts to have a number of impacts 
And we're going to talk about these impacts through the story of Gilgamesh. Now, I like to use the story of Gilgamesh as an example, because it's one of our earliest epics between of man versus the wild. But it's also one of our earliest tales about man killing off its own ecosystem through large through the use of large scale agriculture and the creation of these large cities. So our tale starts here in Mesopotamia, uh, in the king in a kingdom called Uruk. Uruk is down over here by the Persian goat, uh, the Persian Gulf. Um, other important places here is the Dead Sea. Um, over here is the Zargas Mountains. Um, here's the Fertile Crescent, just so you have some orientation. Um, in 2500 BCE, the Persian Gulf was actually larger than it is today. Um, the Tiger, Tigris and Euphrates had, have joined together and now it's much more shallow. Um, and so the coastline was very different. So in the kingdom of Uruk, we have a lot of urbanization and state formation happening. Um, they're one of the dominant kingdoms at the time. And we see the Uruk expansion happen between 4,000 and 3,200 years BCE. This 800 year period really sees a shift from small agricultural villages to a much larger urban center that actually has a bureaucracy and a military and a stratified society. Um, and part of the reason why we see the development of a military because um, if you have the best land and you grow a lot of stuff, other people may want your land and you got to protect it somehow. So we see the development of a military class as well. We also see the demand, especially among the higher classes, for luxuries. And we also see a higher demand for basic goods like wood. Wood becomes a, a huge demand, right? So Wood is used for construction, it's used for furniture, it's used for ships, it's used to cook your food and heat your house. And so as you see more and more people in a space, you see more and more demand for wood. So here in the kingdom of Uruk, we see this greater and greater demand for wood. Well, there's only, only so much wood that can grow in an area. And, and once that wood's used, you start going further and further away to find your wood because you've used all the wood. And, and also you've cleared this land, but now you can grow stuff on it. Um, and of course, the best places to grow are in valleys because water comes down. As you go up the hillside, the, the fertility of the land goes down, um, particularly if that was a wooded area because those trees are actually serving an important purpose to anchor the ground down so you don't have a lot of erosion. The other thing that we see during this time is that we're in the early Bronze Age, which means that we see a demand for bronze and tin. Um, and so we see mining occurring, so you need more wood for mining, um, both for tin and then for copper, and then those are mixed together to create a bronze alloy. So Uruk's agricultural surplus and large population base facilitated processes such as trade, specialization in crafts, the evolution of writing. Um, there is some estimates that writing might have actually started in Uruk. All right, so who is this Gilgamesh guy and why do we care about him? All right, so... The king of Gilga and king of Uruk, Gilgamesh, um, needs wood. And some of the most treasured and coveted woods are over in Lebanon. So just so you know, Lebanon is over this way. You can plop that wood in the Euphrates River and bring it right down to Uruk. So the woods have a protector. Um, and the protector is 
supposed to stop the humans from coming into the woods because the the now Gilgamesh is two thirds god and one third man, like like all kings are, of course. Um, and Gilgamesh is actually kind of a dick, honestly. He's oppressing a lot of his people. His people are crying out to the gods, um, and um, we we see part of this is that uh, he goes and tries to figure out how to get this wood. So there is a a, a buddy he ends up with, Eduk, um, and it, sorry, in Kiduk. Um, and they actually are warned off about entering the cedar woods, but Gilgamesh is so confident that he can challenge the, um, forest guardian, Humbaba, um, and they have a fight, they threaten each other, and, um, Enkidu actually betrays Humbaba and uh, Gilgamesh ends up winning the fight and he is able to take the woods. So a lot of this area in the Middle East is full of woods and little by little, they take multiple trees. Now these are big trees. This is one of the cedar, Lebanese, uh, Lebanon cedar trees. These are highly prized and highly valued trees. And after Gilgamesh, his son and his grandson, et cetera, take more and more of this wood and end up actually deforesting the whole area. So what can we learn from the tale of Gilgamesh and his successors? So first we learn about the impact of deforestation. Um, they use both chopping down trees, right? So they have axes and woodsmen and everything like that. All of that, by the way, uses fire. To create those axes, um, you need heat to, to mold the metal, to make sure you have the axe handles, that's more wood. You usually fire treat the axe handles to make them stronger. Um, you have to travel there and back, which means food and heat. So you're using a lot of wood in this process. And of course you have to maintain the axes, so you're using more fire there. Um, so they chop down a lot of these trees, both for the wood itself, but also increased farmland. Unfortunately, this deforestation process actually increased a lot of the silt runoff into the rivers because the trees are no longer stabilizing the hillsides and they're not stabilizing the waterways anymore. Um, this actually ends up screwing them over because um, farmers' irrigation canals become full of silt. And this silt actually ends up changing the riverways and the tributaries, and it also extends the uh, sense the 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 land out because of how much runoff there is. So here in the Persian Gulf, where the rivers come out, we actually see land creation, which pushes these kingdoms farther and farther inland. Which means if you're a port city, you're trying to do trading and everything like that. Your, your ports keep getting pushed further and further out and they keep getting filled in. Um, we also see an increase of fire in this ecosystem because of all the slash that's occurred. Um, and so fires are worse because of the oils and resins of the wood that's already on the ground. So, and also you have more humans in the area burning fires themselves. So the odds of those human induced fires creating fire in the ecosystem also increases. Um, we also see an increase in salt in the water because a lot of the hillsides have greater salt contents because they're seabed floors. Um, and so as that silt is washing into these rivers, it's increasing the salt content in the water and into the runoff. Um, and so that also, also contributes to the killing off of crops. It also causes desertification of the landscapes because when you cut down all the trees, you actually dry out the soils. Those soils have evolved with a certain amount of tree cover and they depend upon that tree cover in order to keep their moisture. And when you expose those soils 
we see that they become dry, they become no longer aerable for crop use. Um, also, the soils up the hills are not great. So Gilgamesh is often framed as a tale of man versus the wilds and man overcoming the wilds. But Gilgamesh's choices actually end up leading to the downfall of his own civilization because he did not take care of his ecosystem. So this is a very important tale when we think through why we want to be very conscientious when we're talking about agriculture. Um, so early agriculture is mostly riv uh, riverine agriculture. So these are on the natural floodplains. Um, farmers would burn away unclogged waterways and irrigation. And again, here is major river systems. This is the valley area. This is where agriculture starts to develop because we're on a floodplain. This is exactly the type of place where we have riverine agriculture. Um, often you'll do fallow fields for at least a season or two. You'll burn down things that you don't want there and then you'll be able to plant again. The burning is actually very important because it helps bring nutrients back into the soils. Also, if you're in this really awesome area right next to the river, the river flooding becomes another way that you're adding nutrients into, back into your soils. Um, uh, Egypt is probably the best known of the floodplains, farming on the floodplains. Um, but they're certainly not the only ones. Most agriculture actually starts usually by some sort of waterway. You can also get your waterways to go out into other fields, depending upon the technologies you have um, as well. But this is the easiest way for us to engage in agriculture. And of course, there's also a lot of socio-political things going on here because um, doesn't everybody want their farm right here by the river on the best land where you have to do the least amount of work to water your crops and be able to graze your animals and everything like that? Of course, that's the case. So again, this is part of the reason why we see the development of both the concept of resource ownership, who gets the land, who gets the water, but we also see the socio-political issues around war and conquest and trading start to come up as well. One of the ways that we can see riverine start to shift is through the Swidden system. So Swidden is a series of slash and burn plots, usually used for a single season and the left fallow. In some places, they have to be left fallow for almost a decade. Um, but you have this cycle of cut, graze, burn, plant, rest. Rest can be a very long time. Um, usually your best yield is that first time that you plant and harvest. And usually you have diminishing returns after that. Um, burning actually opens up the site to the sun is great if you're planting crops that like a lot of sun, not great if you're planting crops that don't. Um, and of course, over and over again, you have a lot of people using these same places. So you really see diminishment in the viability of the soil, even if you're doing things like having animals, right? So animal grazing becomes a very important part of the cycle because manure is a very important nutrient that you can add back in the, so the soil, especially for nitrogen. Um, and then, of course, we have a fixed rotation system. This is often on less desirable lands than um, Swidden's or Riverine's. Um, it follows the same cycles as Swidden, uh, Swiddles, but the land much more quickly stops supporting the crops. Usually, this happens when a population has outgrown all the desirable farming land and they're starting to take over slopes. The steeper the slope, the crappier the soil. Um, and the more likely you are to have impacts below that, um, below on the other um, fields that are below that area. It can take years of being fallow 
um, in order to revive the land. Like I said, sometimes up to a decade. And that's even if you're doing nitrogen fixing crops like legumes and building back the soil, um, eventually the, the nutrients just doesn't, just runs out. Also, the higher up the, up the hills you go, the um, less drainage you get and uh, the, the, and the, um, the plants just don't do as well. What you can't see is that there is a deer actually grazing right outside my window. I just needed to share that with you all. The last thing we're gonna talk about today is fire and livestock. Um, fire, we've talked about with first fire, how we see um, fire in grasslands more than we see fire other places. And of course, the development of fire of grasslands allows for the development of larger herds of animals like the deer that was eating the tree outside my window. Um, and of course, it changes the species that are dominant. Now, when humans start to get out there and burn a lot of grass um, grasslands, we are intentionally doing this to be able to increase the quality of grazing for our livestock. Um, and of course, we also are burning to move herds to places where we want them. Um, and with domestication and selective breeding, we, we end up with certain types of livestock that we are able to domesticate um, and they're able to forage how humans want them to. So we start using fire as a way to create pastures. Um, so you can see that fire is very important in the development of early agriculture um, and how humans are able to start using fire as a very important tool for agricultural processes. So I hope you learned a little bit about um, hunter-gatherers and the use of fire among those populations as well as how we use fire in our early agricultural practices. I will see you all again in chapter five.